Thanks, Yasmin, for unmuting uh, me and for that kind introduction. Um, and also thanks to everybody joining um, the webinar today. Um, I'm an Associate Director in the Employment Team here at Thursfields, as Yasmin mentioned. We've got a team of six in the Employment Team. Uh, me personally, I look after businesses um, on the HR side, project management and litigation, but we look after employees as well when it comes to settlement agreements and well, any other employment queries they've got too. Um, well, redundancies and coronavirus might seem like a bleak subject, but it is a really important one given the businesses well, given the challenges that businesses are facing, and not a day is going by now without us looking in the press and seeing uh, announcements around job cuts. Centrica made an announcement today, didn't they? And uh, in the local press as well, we can see that even at a regional level, businesses are starting to feel the pain a bit more. Uh, Martin Lewis has recently um, given his opinion that he thinks that there's going to be a wave of redundancies given the upcoming furlough contributions and and changes as the scheme winds down. Um, our take on it is that we think he's right. Um, our experience initially was that businesses were coming to us wanting support on what they can do, what coronavirus job retention scheme is and what their options are. Those queries have died down quite a lot now and our queries are relating to, you know, how can we save jobs? What are our options? What does return to work look like for some of those businesses? Um, and then unfortunately, um, businesses are also coming to us to say that they are going to need to make a headcount reduction. So it is for those reasons that I reached out to the tri uh, chamber and suggested that this might be a useful topic for the businesses in the region. Um, I figured that I would start by um, just giving a very brief overview of the law with regards to redund redundancy dismissals um, touching on collective consultation, uh, trying my best to keep the, the, you know, the guidance really high level because uh, collective consultation is a, a really tricky uh, subject. It's really very complex and anyone that's been involved will, will know that there's, there's some complexities around terminology and time scales. but I'll do my best to summarize that quite neatly. And then I thought I'd move on to sharing with you um, how, we're, how, we, you know, how as practitioners we're expecting the pandemic to affect uh, redundancy dismissals in terms of process and fairness and sharing with you as part of that some of the FAQs we're, we're getting. And then as Yasmin mentioned, we've got time at the end to, to open up the floor to, uh, to, to some Q&A. So with regards to redundancy dismissals then, the first step always is to, is to check that the legal definition is met. So in the Employment Rights Act, section 139, one in particular uh, sets out the definition of what a redundancy is. And there are three types. There is a business closure. The second type is where there is a site or premises closure. And the third and perhaps you know, classic redundancy is where there's a reduced need for employees of particular type. So thinking about that definition, it, it's quite easy to see how the pandemic is going to result in some businesses feeling that, that you know, closures are necessary or that certain parts of the business may need to, uh, need to to um, be um, streamlined and, and, and you know, headcount reduced. Even for businesses where there is a boom, and, and some businesses are doing very well, aren't they, um, during this climate, but even when there is a boom for businesses and they are focusing on new projects, new, new, new product lines or new markets, it may be that even then they are looking to scale back some other sides of their operation and then reorganize their workforce. And that may sometimes have the effect that redundancies are needed as well. I mean, hopefully there, because there are you know, areas within the business that are booming, that alternatives to dismissal are a real possibility. Um, so typically, as I said, redundancy is where there's a business closure, site closure, or reduced headcount. And sometimes reduced headcount can come about by business reorganization. So after, we've satisfied ourselves that that definition is met and, and that's usually fairly easy to do. It's then for a business to start considering numbers to understand what its legal obligations are and then to also plan the process. And this is absolutely critical. So in every redundancy situation, there is always a duty to consult individually. Um, and so that involves looking at selection pools, selection methods, and then consulting with staff about that and then exploring alternatives to dismissal and then you know, dismissing at the end if, 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 if redundancy dismissals can't be avoided. 
but section 1888, sorry, section 1888 of TULCRA creates an additional obligation where an employer is proposing to dismiss 20 or more employees within 90 days or less at one establishment. So that's quite a mouthful. Um, and it covers your classic redundancy where you know, 20 or more people are uh, likely to be dismissed as redundant. And it also covers a sort of fire and rehire where a business might need to collectively change uh, terms and conditions of employment. And if agreement can't be reached that you seek to dismiss and then re-engage on new terms. So 20 is an absolutely critical number for a business. Now it starts getting more complicated where you've got a group of companies because then you might have more than one employer who is proposing to dismiss. And it get, and there's another additional layer of um, complexity when we start examining what establishment means. So for some businesses where there is one employer, they're not part of the group and they've got one site, that will be relatively straightforward. But where, as I say, you've got a group of empl employers, so a group of companies, and or you've got different units, different sites, then we need to start really examining where that headcount reduction is needed. And most HR practitioners will be familiar with the you know, various cases that are looked at this. And this is, you know, a long, there's a long history of debate here over what establishment means. Ethel Austin and the Woolworth cases are two of the biggest ones that we've seen where Woolworths was proposing to dismiss you know, a, a large volume of, of employees. And the question before the courts, the tribunals, was whether Woolworths was together, you know, whether all of its stores combined, Woolworths the brand, was one establishment, or whether as an establishment was each of its stores. And the upshot there was that the tribunal and courts decided that um, one establishment meant each of the stores. And so for those stores where they had fewer than 20 employees, collective consultation obligations weren't triggered, but then those stores where there were more than 20 employees, they would be caught. So you know, the takeaway from that is that it, when, tw when 20 or more employees are, well, when a business is looking at making dismissals for 20 or more employees, that it's really important to get some advice around you know, whether you're caught and indeed the timings of, of, of when for collective consultation kicks in. So what does it mean? Well, in, in, in summary, the, the, the duty comprises of three elements. Number one, there's a duty to inform appropriate representatives about, um, about the redundancy uh, proposals and certain information has to be shared with those appointed representatives. And then number two, you've got to can start consulting with those appropriate representatives about the proposals, ultimately with a view to uh, trying to mitigate those numbers and reach an agreement about the process. And then lastly, there's a legal obligation to notify the Secretary of State. And an employee representative is essentially an umbrella term uh, to cover three separate categories of representation. So one, uh, an employee representative, uh, sorry, representative is a representative of a recognised trade union. So for much larger organisations, they will have a recognised trade union in place. And so the obligation is to collectively consult with those uh, trade union reps. Uh, second type is where there's a standing body of already appointed representatives to handle these kinds of uh, scenarios. And lastly, where there isn't already an existing body or trade union, uh, trade union uh, recognised, then it's for the employer to uh, directly elect, uh, well, hold, it, hold an election process so that appointed uh, representatives are put in place specifically for this, pur for this purpose. Um, so... Uh, for those businesses where there isn't a, a recognised trade union, that again adds another level to the procedure that will need to be, um, need to be planned and, and adopted. And there are some really strict rules about the election process as well. So it's really important to bear in mind that uh, a, looking at when the collective consultation obligation is even triggered in the first place, but also thinking about needing to first factor in an election process as well, which, as I said, adds on time to a process, doesn't it? Now, under TOLCRA as well, um, the law makes it clear that there are certain minimum periods of consultation that have to apply. And so where a business is proposing to dismiss 100 or more employees at one establishment, then the consultation period must begin at least 45 days before the dismissal takes effect. Where a business is looking to dismiss between 20 and 99 employees, 
then that period of time is 30 days. And essentially that acts as a sort of freezing, a, a moratorium between when con consultation commences and when those dismissals can actually take effect. And as I said, if there's an election process, that has to be bolted onto the start of all of that too. Now, whilst we've got those minimum time periods to consider, um, legislation also states that consultations must begin in good time. And what beginning good time looks like is another area of debate and is another, uh, and, 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 and will look very differently for different businesses as well. So for us, we're supporting businesses at the moment in trying to design their processes, thinking about all of these things. You know, when does beginning in good time kick in for a business? You know, and, and, what, and designing what the process looks like thereafter. Um, as a general rule, employers have to be past, past the point of sort of merely contemplating the, the notion of, of mass dismissals, and they've, they've got to sort of advance their proposals a little bit further. And I think that must be right, because if the obligation to consult collectively kicked in the moment we were even contemplating dismissals, then arguably for many of us that will be kicking in now, because it's running through our mind at least that at some point in the future we may need to look at reducing headcount across the business. So I think it must be right that it's more than just a mere contemplation of proposing to dismiss and going a bit further and, and actually starting to put some formula around that. So once collective consultation obligations are, are, are uh, sufficiently advanced, then the, the obligation to start individually consulting staff will then also kick in as well. Um, I really struggle to put collective consultation into, into just a, a neat few paragraphs because it really is, is a really complex area, but um, that, that is it in a nutshell. And uh, the question of how the pandemic has affected that is quite simple. Um, the law hasn't changed at all. My, my, my view is that all that it really means is that um, we need to uh, start planning more than ever the timetable and of course planning any redundancy exercise is, is critical and getting that right is, is, is key um, but now because there's no relaxation of those rules whatsoever uh, timetabling and, and really planning the process is, is, is going to be critical not least because not all of our employees are, are at work. So bearing that in mind, I wanted to spend some time exploring uh, what COVID pandemic, uh, well, what the effect the COVID pandemic has had on redundancy dismissals. Now, a few weeks back, we had the latest government announcement about what winding down the furlough scheme looks like. And we all knew that the scheme was going to be ending at the uh, end of October. And we now know that there are going to be certain contributions that are mandatory for employers to make towards wage costs from August onwards. And so because of that announcement, my view, um, that's really pushed redundancies to the top of an agenda for businesses. And businesses now, knowing that the end is in sight with regards to the coronavirus job retention scheme, should start thinking about measures to return to work. And I know the Chamber have been hosting a number of series about furlough and returning to work and you know, the health and safety uh, aspects of that. Um, another option might very well be to continue the furlough scheme with employee um, consent, albeit of course that will mean um, there will be no ability to claim against the grant once it's closed, but continuing furlough potentially is, is something that can be agreed with, with um, employees, with businesses picking up the wage costs. Examining other, pe other unpaid leave, and uh, unfortunately for many, may mean looking at redundancies instead. So when I'm talking to businesses, we're having conversations about what uh, the mandatory contributions from August looks like for them and what impact that has. And some of the businesses I'm talking to are really going to struggle to meet even the um, small um, wage, uh, wage contributions from August, which when, you know, the, the, the announcement was more generous than we were expecting it to be and flexi furlough was introduced a month earlier, but even with those, um, those wins, uh, some businesses are gonna really struggle to meet those additional wage costs from August. Then of course the, the position for them worsens as the contributions increase over September and October. Um, so businesses are, are exploring already, uh, looking at making redundancies whilst the scheme is in place, uh, and also thinking about what actually is gonna happen at the end of the scheme 
if getting people back into work isn't going to be an option for them. Um, I'm supporting a client at the moment who is going to be making redundancies, uh, large scale redundancies too, because they are in the event sector. And so they already know that with the wind out of the scheme in October, that they don't have event bookings until 2021. And so they aren't going to wait until the end of the scheme to start their processes. We're designing those now so that we are consulting with good time in accordance with obligations and giving us some breathing space as well. So knowing that that scheme is being wound down and knowing that those are mandatory contributions are coming, there are some really important deadlines to be aware of. So 31st of October, 2020, the scheme ends. So working back from there, we know that the last possible deadline to start collective consultation when we're looking at a headcount reduction of between 20 and 99 is going to be the 1st of October. So at the very latest, that is the cutoff for collective consultation when we're talking about those numbers. For larger scale redundancies, where we're talking 100 plus, then the last possible deadline, of course, to begin our consultations collectively is the 16th of October. And as I mentioned before, where there is no trade union body recognised, we need to factor in some time before that for the election process too. And in any event, the law is quite clear that consultation should begin in good time, so well before then, which is why businesses are already reaching out for support about programme in that regard. My observation is that the pandemic is going to have or is already having effect on timings because of that need to start planning return to work, what that looks like. And if we can't get people back, then the redundancy exercise. We've got man mandatory timeframes to be mindful of as well. But of course, we need some additional flexibility around each of those processes, election, collective consultation, or even if that, that doesn't apply because your numbers are below 20. Um, we've still got individual consultation obligations too. So we need some ad additional flexibility around that, given that we've got some of our staff who may be on furlough, so are away from the business. We've got some who are perhaps shielding, got those who are working from home, some in the business, some are not. So because of that, um, I think one of the biggest impacts the, the pandemic is having on our process is, is uh, is, is having to factor in those, those additional timings and flexibilities as well. Um, I keep labouring the point about taking timely advice and planning well, and as a lawyer, I would do that, wouldn't I? Because we, you know, we, we like to prepare and our job ultimately is to you know, avoid unfair dismissals and to mitigate exposure for businesses. Um, but what I haven't mentioned is that there are some severe penalties for not meeting these obligations. And so if an employer doesn't meet the collective consultation obligations, then the exposure is to a protective award of 90 days gross pay per employee. So that can get pretty chunky, pretty sizable. And then not notifying the Secretary of State is a criminal offence, and that uh, uh, has its obvious consequences. Uh, but also, not getting the collective consultation obligations right could affect the fairness of the dismissal overall as well which may mean that um, a business is exposed to unfair dismissal claims. So it's a really tricky area of law, uh, but it is a really important one because the financial consequences of getting it wrong are just so severe. Some businesses have asked me whether the fact of the coronavirus itself is, is, a, is, a, is a good enough justification to defend any failure to meet those obligations. And the sort of brutal answer there is it's highly, highly unlikely. Um, similarly, not knowing that you're caught by collective consultation obligations is not going to be an excuse uh, or, or an opportunity to defend. Um, thinking about some of the questions that I get asked, I've just pulled something up on my screen to remind myself of some queries that came in, but um, two of the main questions we're being asked is, can you carry out collective consultation, or, or actually, can you carry out any consultation, whether collective or individual, during furlough? And, and our take on that is, is that any form of consultation can be undertaken where staff are on, on furlough. And there are some very good reasons why employers would want to do it that way, um, because you know, letting staff know 
in good time is, is good from an employee relations perspective. Um, you know, the staff knowing where they stand and again, thinking about the timings and, and the additional layers of, of responsibility there. Employers might also want to start consultation now because they may want to absorb some of the cost of the consultation period in the furlough scheme. And I'll come on into just a moment about what may or may not be claimed back from the scheme uh, when redundancy dismissals are, are, are happening. And the second question that crops up time and time again is, can we make an employee on furlough redundant? And the very simple answer there is, is, is yes, uh, because in our view, the guidance is quite clear. This is employee guidance, that is. It is quite clear that employees can may, be made redundant uh, on furlough or, or afterwards. Now, whilst I think we've got some certainty over those two questions, what is an area of debate is whether the availability of the job retention scheme will affect the overall fairness of a dismissal. And so some businesses are therefore concerned that the availability of that scheme may mean that if they make dismissals uh, will lead them, well, expose them to unfair dismissal claims. Um, well, I think the aim of the scheme is, of course, to save jobs. And so in theory, I think it's absolutely possible that employees will seek to challenge the fairness of their dismissals by arguing that those dismissals could have been avoided by making better use of the furlough scheme or that the employers acted too prematurely by going down the redundancy dismissal route now and not waiting to see what the future looks like in you know, October. And I'm sympathetic to that, actually, because there, you know, the, the, the announcements that we're getting from the government change very frequently. The, the status of the pandemic is, is, is changing on a daily basis. And so I think, I think the answer to the question is a, is a real lawyer's answer in that I think it very much depends. I can certainly see tribunals being sympathetic towards employees. And so I think there is a real risk that tribunals will start looking at um, you know, the basis for redundancies in the first place, whereas they might not have been as concerned about that pre um, COVID-19 uh, days. Um, but the reason why I say I think the answer to that question is it depends is because, you know, it, it's really obvious that certain sec sectors are more, well, uh, you know, disproportionately affected than others. So take, take the client that I was referring to is in the event sector. I think it's very difficult to see how the availability of the job retention scheme um, can then lead a tribunal to conclude that it wasn't fair for my client there to dismiss when they haven't got any bookings at all until the new year. So there's a gulf, isn't there, between the scheme ending in October and the new year. Um, but then for other industries, maybe it looks very different. We're now getting announcements about which businesses can start opening their doors or not. Um, what um, I'm advising businesses to, to really start doing is to uh, un, you know, underpin their decision with a real clear business rationale and being able to back that up with some data as well. Um, um, a final point, uh, again, I think the jury's out on this particular question, but some commentators, and, and you might indeed have read this yourself online, but some commentators have also expressed concern that HMRC will be very quick to question rapid redundancies to see if there's been an abuse of the scheme in the first place. Um, I haven't got a particularly strong view on that, and I think the jury certainly is out, but I think it is very risky. Um, um, and I, I, I think the revenue will be certainly very keen to start looking into uh, potential abuses of the system and, you know, that furlough fraud is quite a common term at the moment. There are businesses who are refusing, refusing, refusing it. Um, it wouldn't be a presentation about redundancy dismissals without touching, touching on um, notice entitlements. Um, questions we're getting around that are the you know, redundancies are necessary can we give notice to an employee on furlough and the answer I think to that is the guidance does not expressly deal with that we may have uh, some more clarity around that tomorrow when the government you know makes another announcement and this is and issues more guidance but our take on that is the answer is is yes just simply because the guidance is clear that employees can be made redundant on furlough so our take is that employees can then be served notice whilst they're on furlough too. A different question, or, and indeed a more difficult question, is, well, what is their notice pay entitlement uh, when an employee is on furlough? 
So if notice is worked out during fur furlough, then you know, the position is, is really tricky, it's really complex. There are some arguments that in some instances, notice pay can be limited to the furlough rate of pay. Um, however, I think uh, where commentators are concerned there are ex is exposure is that individuals may say that there is breach of a contract or a lawful deduction from wages claims. And so a least risky approach, even though there may be some technical arguments around notice being at the furlough rate of pay, a least risky approach would be to pay notice pay or at least top up notice pay to 100% to keep uh, unlawful deduction for wages and breach of contract claims um, at bay. Uh, tying nicely into what can be claimed against the scheme then, um, bearing in mind, I've just mentioned that we think that notice can be given during furlough um, and worked out, we often get asked the question, therefore, well, can those notice payments be claimed against this uh, coronavirus job retention scheme? And again, this is not explicitly de dealt within the guidance at all, um, but our take is that it's absolutely possible and it certainly seems to feel that way at the moment. Lawyers are, or certainly we are heavily caveating our advice to say that the HM, you know, HMRC could retrospectively decide that notice pay is a, is, a, is a payment that should be borne by the employer only. Uh, but at the moment, it looks as though no, notice can be sort of essentially wound down during the furlough and the amount can be claimed, or at least a portion of it can be claimed against the, um, the, the scheme. What absolutely isn't uh, possible to claim against the scheme is a payment in lieu of notice. Um, there are a few reasons for that. First of all, an employer exercising a pile on clause, if indeed there is one in the contract, is exercising discretion. So that's one factor. And the other, of course, is that unlike notice, which is being worked and paid for prior to the termination date, a payment in lieu of notice is something that comes after the termination date. And so for those reasons, a payment in lieu of notice payment is not something that we feel can be claimed against the scheme. In terms of redundancy costs, guidance is very clear that uh, statutory redundancy payments will continue to be calculated in the normal way using a formula based on age, length of service and, and gross weekly pay. And the guidance is also very clear that the furlough grant can't be used to pay for that redundancy payment, contractual or statutory. And so that is a cost that will need to be met by the employer too. It's a similar position with regards holiday pay. So if staff are being obliged to take their holiday whilst on furlough, then we know that that's being topped up to 100%, but an element of it can be claimed against the scheme. The, 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 the difference is that if it's paid on termination, uh, then that is, a, again, it's a, it's a cost that needs to be met by the employer. So I mentioned the expression new normal earlier, and I think we've got a, a new normal when it comes to returning to work and what that looks like for businesses and their employees. But I think we've also got a new normal when it comes to looking at our consultation obligations as well. You know, it's certainly more tricky now, given that it's, we may need to be undertaking some of those exercises remotely. Uh, I've commented on timings, but what I haven't spent too much time talking about just yet is the sort of logistics around that. So traditionally, we would be meeting uh, with individuals or groups in meetings. So we may have town hall sort of style meetings where we meet with groups to make announcements and then follow up with individual face to face meetings with with employees. But the pandemic means that you know, we've got a mixture of employees who are on furlough. Uh, we've got individuals who are shielding the social distancing considerations, childcare, childcare factors, working from home, self isolating, all of those things which means that for some of us, looking at how we're gonna do some of these processes remotely is a, is a real key consideration. Uh, thankfully, the starting point is that past case law has made it quite clear that you can carry out information and consultation obligations remotely. So any initial fears about um, consultation obligations not being properly met because we're not able to do things face to face is, is a fear that we can quite easily sort of quash, I suppose. And the businesses that we're working for, working with rather, 
they're looking at embracing different technologies, video conferencing, we're obviously doing Zoom now, um, Teams, all sorts of those technologies which we're embracing to hold meetings, whether they're by group or individually. Um, and at this point, and this is where there is a real disadvantage to a webinar, I think, and you know, I talked to Yasmin, I think just yesterday about whether there's a preference for webinars going forwards or face to face. But for me personally, I, you know, I, I love the interaction with delegates and I'm really missing that today. That's my, my little confession. Um, but this is the point at which I'd open up the floor for a bit of discussion about what we're all doing, because you know, it strikes me that on the call, we've got businesses who have got who are smaller businesses. We've got some, uh, some large businesses all from different sectors as well. So you know, a face-to-face -face seminar will be a real good opportunity to sort of share what we're doing and best practice. But, we're at a bit of a disadvantage, but maybe we can get some of that in the in the chat and the comment section at, at the end. Um, so yeah, embracing technologies is, is an obvious one. I don't think it's uh, it, it's 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 always perfect, but it's, it's it might be the best that we can do. Uh, similarly, telephone conferencing we've still got that um, again may not be ideal for for some, just simply because it's really difficult to gauge how somebody is feeling, how you know how they're reacting to you know news that's being delivered and you can't pick up body language and cues in the same way but that telephone conferencing is certainly an option too and then in some some instances it may be safe to even have the meetings face to face and indeed i'm looking after a business at the moment small scale um small scale redundancies um, where they have a, a an aging workforce and the employees who are involved in the process are not able to embrace technologies in, in the same way as, as others that you know they don't have smartphones or laptops um they don't really want a call or be it we've, we've done some calls so far and their preference is to have uh, have consultation meetings face to face and that may be possible provided that and it's a really really strong provided that um you know appropriate risk assessments are being carried out we are you know adopting measures that uh, make it safe for those face-to-face -face meetings to take place social distancing ppe all of that stuff we're hearing in the press um uh, but, but again i think the the important message i think during all of the presentations today and all of the ones around furlough and returning to work is that you know health and safety and well-being of staff is is, is absolutely critical but in, in some instances, it may be possible to have meetings face to face, but it needs to be thoroughly explore, explored in advance. So when embracing that new approach, these new technologies, I think employers need to be mindful of protected characteristics. So I touched on age just a moment ago where embracing certain technologies just wasn't an option for my client um, because those individuals didn't have access to those technologies. Um, We've got to look at um, those who are shielding mental health conditions, disabilities, to think about what adjustments might be needed. Language barriers as well. So it's going to be very difficult to have a Zoom meeting or a conference call without a translator present. So we've got these additional things to be considering as well, that this new approach using technologies isn't always perfect. We need to really look at individuals on a case-by-case -case basis to understand what a good consultation with them might look like. Um, you know, got to start considering just have everyone have access to the technologies and, you know, setting some good protocol and agenda in advance, like Yasmin did with this call today, making it quite clear what the, you know, what the parameters were. We're working with some business to potentially use data rooms to start sharing information, because one of the key considerations for business is also making sure that information is shared in a, in a way that is safe and is compliant with data protection principles as well. So the use of data rooms might be one of the ways in which to do that. In terms of some other, you know, more practical considerations in terms of getting communication out to staff, it's a really simple one, but you know, do, do we have up-to-date contact details for people? If we're going to be sending things out to email, do we have personal email addresses and do we have the consent to, to, to keep those personal emails, uh, email addresses, given it amounts to personal data? You know, so how are we going to start contacting staff? The post is slow, email uh, may not be the appropriate method given the sensitivities around the information that's being shared. So using a courier might be something that we do instead. And what I didn't mention at the start of the introduction is that 
Um, my career has always been in Worcestershire, apart from a bit of time that I spent away at DLA Piper, which is a, an international firm, and I've recently rejoined Thursfield from there. And so some of the businesses we were looking after there, you know, we're looking after some, you know, global, well-known brands. And so security was a real, real consideration for those, given the adverse PR or just general PR they could get. So um, looking at sending communication out safely was, was paramount for those businesses. Um, and then thinking more about the logistics of the individual consultation meetings then, and we talked about, or I mentioned perhaps, thinking about disabilities and having translators present if there were barrier, language barriers. But uh, even though there's no statutory right to be accompanied to redundancy consultation meetings, it is considered best practice and I would say market norm. And so thinking about the right of accompaniment, how are we going to be able to accommodate the right of accompaniment, uh, whether that's a trade union rep or a companion, and it may be that an option is to widen the right of accompaniment and exercise some discretion and allow the individual to be accompanied to a meeting like that by a family member, friend or housemate. Um, but I think it perhaps is important to check that no one else is in the room and it might, thinking about that sort of logically, that, that might be something that's difficult to, to check in practice. We've also got considerations, of course, about what happens after termination of employment with regard to returning company property. Uh, you have mentioned uh, courier or dropping off um, or collecting property in a socially distanced uh, and safe way. So there are considerations around what happens on termination too, um, as well as, well as uh, what other things we should be doing as employers to support our staff at difficult times like these with health and well-being uh, being at the forefront of minds, you know, re you know, regular catch-ups, should we be signposting our uh, employees to different support that's out there? Should we be getting in touch with the local chamber and Chamber of Commerce might be able to put, put businesses in touch with health providers and, and other outplacement or counselling support? So we've got, we've got those other, uh, other uh, wider considerations as, as well. So I think, as always, it's really important that the businesses are you know, encouraging uh, a dialogue with their individuals about the way they're going to communicate with them going forward and what is best for them, given that everybody is, a unique, uh, is in a unique situation. And you know, we are suggesting that having those discussions really early doors at the start of a process and also potentially raising that as one of the points with appropriate representatives during the consultation phase. So whilst there's no statutory obligation to do that, you know, it makes sense, I think, in practical terms to try to agree those arrangements and those methods going forward with those appointed representatives or the trade union bodies that are in place. And, and that includes, of course, in, uh, you know, safeguarding health with face-to-face -face meetings and the way forward. And the other quick win, I think, is to set the rules in advance, you know, make it sure that any meetings or conference calls, Zoom, team meetings, however, However, we're going to communicate with uh, staff going forwards, uh, you know, conducted in the quiet room, uh, like Yasmin did, set out the meeting ex uh, etiquette, comfort breaks, factoring those in, making use of, and I'm not, I'm not doing that today, but I could have made use of sharing my screen and sharing documents with you, uh, and then setting the rules around uh, note taking. Something that cropped up on a redundancy exercise that I was looking after, and looking after at the moment, was whether um, employees are able to record the meeting. So um, I think, you know, checking whether an employee is recording the meeting and explaining that isn't something that is acceptable to the business might be something that you would want to do. And then of course, if they, they end up recording the meeting, then we get into the rounds of breach and trust and confidence and, and misconduct matters. On the flip side, I'm certainly not suggesting that you shouldn't allow staff to record meetings. And indeed, there are some really good reasons why you might allow that. Um, but for my particular client I was looking after, it was, it was not something that they, they were comfortable with. And, and, and indeed, their, 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 their code of conduct and their handbook was quite clear. Meetings couldn't be recorded in any event. So I'm just conscious of time. I've you know, been talking for around 45 minutes. The key takeaways for, for me really are what to share with you. Are that the planning, planning now for the new reality is, 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 is critical, whether that's around returning to work or or looking at reducing headcounts and what that process looks like and might entail. 
um, considering numbers is absolutely the starting point as well to, to understand whether collective consultation obligations triggered or not. And you know, it might not all be doom and gloom. Um, one of the steps, of course, is always to consider alternatives to dismissal, and, and there are some, and so dismissal, you know, always being a last resort. Um, so it is a really difficult time. I, I recognise that. And so you know, we at First Field are trying very hard to support as businesses in these difficult times. So more than happy for you to all get in touch with me separately to, to pick my brains on matters. Um, we can be as involved with, with, with businesses as much or as little as they need to be. So some of the businesses I'm working with at the moment have very large HR teams. So we are designing the redundancy programme with them, but we're certainly not involved in the operation side of things. On the other side of uh, the scale, we've got businesses where we are designing everything from the scripts to the letters and holding their hand throughout the process. So look, it is a really difficult time. And so um, I'm sure if anyone has any queries now that they want to uh, to ask they certainly can or we can chat afterwards no problem at all wonderful are you done there lisa yeah, really opening up there to the floor now perfect thank you so much i hope everyone found that useful um and yeah i'd like to um encourage any questions um in the chat box we have got a few um so what i'm going to do is i'm going to read them out to you um, and then um, hopefully you'll be able to answer them. So I'm going to start from the top. So I've got a question that is, should employers automatically enter a settlement agreement when making an employee redundant? So I think the answer to that is no, they shouldn't automatically enter into a settlement agreement. Um, but there are certainly some very good reasons why an employer might want to do that. Um, if there is risk around the dismissals or uh, if there is you know, any other sort of employment or HR risk, then entering into a settlement agreement is a way to close down those claims. So where there is risk, closing down that risk by a settlement agreement would be a good route. Um, another time where settlement agreements are appropriate is where an employee is being paid more than their statutory or, or legal entitlements on termination. So where uh, enhanced payments are being made, it is uh, quite normal for an employer to want something in return and what they want in return normally is for the employee to accept those payments but in return uh, agree to their terms ending and waiving their legal rights. So uh, in enhanced, enhanced payments often uh, mean getting a settlement agreement to put that protection in place. Um, and some businesses do it because that's part of their, their process. Okay, thank you. Next is, we only need to make two people redundant based on reduced needs. Can we start the consultation now with the view to make their final date of employment at the end of October so they can benefit from the furlough scheme for the next few months whilst they are looking for an alternative employment? Yeah, so I'm going to answer that on the assumption that the background work around you know where headcount reduction is needed and pools have all been sorted out and, and and it's been identified there are two roles at risk so i'm going to assume that that's that's all happened and and uh, it, it's about kicking off the process the the, the answer is the answer is yes um, so one of the questions that i shared earlier which is an faq is whether you can consult during the furlough period or, or, or the, you know whilst the schemes in place and the answer is yes and whether you can serve notice um, I don't know anything about where the queries come from to know how the business is affected, but knowing that employees could could say, well, um, that doesn't feel fair to me or, or, you know, it feels like an abuse of the scheme because, it, you know, between the June, well, June the 11th and, you know, the end of October is a long time uh, is, is, you know, is a, is a, is a risk factor. So, um, I would want to explore with that client a little bit more what the business rationale, I suppose, is behind knowing, knowing now that headcount reduction of two is going to be needed so far, you know, so far down the track. So the, the, quick, the quick answer is yes, it's possible, but I'd like to understand whether there are any risks around that for the client. Okay, thanks, Lisa. Next is, um, so the elected person need only to be appointed where 20 or more redundancies are proposed in a company with no recognised TU or consultative body in place, or is this generally? Yeah, absolutely. So when you're talking a headcount reduction of 20 or less, 
we just have the individual consultation obligations to satisfy. So it is only necessary to collectively consult, uh, consult when the number is 20 or more at one establishment, which is, which is key. So all at the same establishment um, within a period of 90 days or not. So if 20 or more are proposed to be made redundant at one establishment, then the yeah, collective consultation is triggered. Fab, okay. Next, uh, will it be seen as an unfair or, or unreasonable redundancy if not use the furlough scheme first? Possibly is the answer to that, yeah. So I think we explored that a little bit. Um, I think there are two risk factors. One certainly is the employee saying that that isn't fair and that then may affect the fairness of the dismissal at the end of the process. The other risk area is, 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 is the fact that HMRC may, may, be, may uh, look into sort of rapid redundancies and see it as an as a abuse of the scheme. But, uh, you know, I was quite clear that the jury's out on that one for me. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not so sure. Okay. Fab, thank you. Next. Uh, so, whilst preparing our business for the new normal, it's obvious to us that it's likely that there are there will need to, we will need to make some staff redundant. To this, to this end, we are writing to staff with an update about what we are doing to get ready, what their job roles may look like when they return, and preparing them for possibility of redundancies. But for now, continuing on furlough as we have done since March. During the process of making redundancies, where do we stand if a key member of staff volunteers redundancy, but that member of staff would have been key to our plans of recovery? Do we have to accept their voluntary redundancy or can we ask them to rescind such notice? Okay, so that was quite a long one. Um, so the, I think the key question there, Yasmin, if I understand it, is, some, is an employee has approached the business to say that they would like to leave on a voluntary redundancy basis and the business wants to know whether they can uh, push back and say no effectively to that. And um, well, the, again, the answer, the answer is, is yes. Um, what, isn't, what, isn't, what was missing, I think, from the question is whether the business would be inviting applicants in the first place. But the word invitation is, is critical anyway, because inviting an applicant doesn't mean that you will grant a voluntary redundancy um, to that applicant. So an employer would be okay to say no in the same way that if an employee was to approach them out of the blue about voluntary redundancy, an employer would be able to say no and explain the reasons for that. I think the challenge, however, is that you've then got an employee who doesn't want to stay necessarily and is quite keen to leave for whatever those reasons might be, you know, personal reasons. And so there may be some, um, some, some, some challenges in the employment relationship going forward. Okay, I hope that answers your question. And if it uh, does, then please, um, yeah, then please let me know afterwards. It's quite a, quite a long narrative. Yeah, please let us know um, and Lisa will be able to answer afterwards. Okay, I think this is the last question. Um, so if anyone does have any more questions, um, we have got a few minutes, so um, please pop them in now. I'm just gonna uh, read this one then. So I've used Zoom and Teams for consultations, but note taking is a challenge. We submit these afterwards and ask colleagues to check the content and confirm if it accurately reflects the discussion. Is this sufficient or are there con other considerations we need to take? Yeah, it certainly sounds like a good idea. And even when we're not doing things virtually and notes are being kept at meetings for our own audit trail and record keeping purposes, I think it's always a good idea to share those minutes with the employee anyway, so that they can go through it and push back on any areas that they are, you know, that they don't necessarily agree with. So I certainly think that that sounds like a really good um, strategy and, and doing, doing that. Um, an option might be to allow the individual to also take their own notes. Um, and despite what I said about recording the meeting, it may be that that's the additional step that's also taken as well to think about making a, 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 um, a sound or video recording of the meeting too, uh, albeit just think about where that's going to be saved and retained given its personal information and we've got obligations into the Data Protection Act there as well. Perfect, thank you. Um, we do have another question. Um, so can we issue an at-risk letter before a meeting consultation? Ooh, well, 
most processes, whether individual or collective, are kicked off with an announcement. Um, what, what I don't know from the question is what numbers we're talking about, but most processes anyway are kicked off with an announcement around, um, around you know, potential redundancies. If that at-risk correspondence was to go into more detail, then that might not be acceptable if collective consultation is triggered because that bit would need to be taken first. So I guess the answer to that question is it depends what the contents of the at-risk says. If it's a general sort of um, workforce uh, an update or an announcement, then it might well be fine. If it's an at if it's an at risk letter to employees in particular roles, then the answer will depend on whether collective consultation is triggered or not. Okay, um, Susan's just confirmed that it's under twenty people. Yeah, so so it, again, the, the the first bit of correspondence that will typically go out is an announcement that roles are at risk, and um, when it's an individual consultation exercise, then you tend to have two bits of correspondence going out, one an, an at risk that specific roles are redundant to those who have been identified as sitting in those roles and then um, sometimes what communication will go out to those individuals who are not in those roles to say whilst there's a redundancy exercise within the business it has not been identified at this stage that your role is one of those that's affected. Perfect thanks Lisa okay and we've, we've had another question so we are about to start First individual consultation meetings. I am inclined to expand on the business reasons already announced broadly as well as sharing the selecting criteria. Is this okay? I'm really sorry, Yasmin. Could you repeat the question? <laughs> yeah, no, that's fine. For me. I don't know if I don't know if I've been quiet for everybody else, but you're a little quiet for me. Am I? Can you hear me now? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. OK, we are about to start first individual consultation meetings. I am inclined to expand on the business reasons already announced broadly, as well as sharing the selecting criteria. Is this OK? Yeah, I think it's I think it's a good idea. And um, in any event, when um, you are notifying individuals that roles are at risk, you would tend to give some narrative around the uh, you know the, the reasons are, are around the business reasons around that, and so the communication now might go a little further to say you know, these are our business. This is how COVID nineteen has affected us. So then, sort of set out in a few paragraphs what what the effect might be. So uh, you know, a client I'm working with at the moment, he his communication is going out to say that the supply chain that he is in is affected, and therefore the knock on effect for this business is that trading is low, and the supply chain for him, if you if you if you go through it, it goes all the way to the Far East. So um, that's the knock-on effect for him, and he's explained that in his communication to say, you know, trading is poor, and until that supply chain recovers, then he's not going to be able to recover as well. And that's why I say he, the business, the business isn't going to be able to recover until the supply chain recovered, and he doesn't envisage that that will be until some time after the scheme has ended. So yeah, I'm I'm quite pro about. Uh, communication around business reasons. Perfect. Thank you, Lisa. I think that's everyone's um, questions done. Um, so thank you ever so much for answering those um, and taking the time out to come and present to us today. Um, everyone's found it useful um, and there's been some lovely comments in um, the group chat box. So thank you very much, Lisa. Um, just before um, I end the session then, um, the Chamber are doing a few webinars next week. Um, so starting with on Tuesday, um, we've got cost control and reduction in a challenging climate and that's three till four. Wednesday 12 till 1 we've got B2B grant funding opportunities. Wednesday 3 till 4 we've got part-time furlough and employment law update. Thursday 12 till 1 we've got networking and Thursday 3 till 4 we've got how to manage a safe return to the workplace. Um, so if you would like to join us on any of those webinars please let me know um, and I can book you on. Um, I believe that's it from me. Um, I hope everyone's found that beneficial to their business um, and thank you for joining us and take care. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye.